Hi, I'm Pratip Malik and I teach physics at Azim Premji University. Um, very involved with the various interesting scientific things going on at the university, uh, many of which are student-led. So we have a physics club, we uh, do regular stargazing nights, a um, lot of students turn up. Uh, we have also invited staff and their families to come. So it's a pretty vibrant space in terms of all the things we do in physics and astronomy. Uh, ISRO has launched three missions to the moon, Chandrayaan-1, Chandrayaan-2 and Chandrayaan-3. Uh, all three of them actually, the goal is to go and find water on the moon. So there is speculation that there is water and Chandrayaan-1 actually did find some water. It was just an orbiter, so it was actually orbiting the moon and it found evidence of water on the lunar surface. Chandrayaan-2, the idea was that there would be a rover, a lander and a rover that would land on the moon. Unfortunately, the landing part of that mission did not go very well and the lander crashed. So the learning from that mission uh, has gone into Chandrayaan-3, where just today, in a few hours, hopefully uh, this Pragyan rover will actually land uh, on the moon. And uh, it'll land in a very special part of the moon, which is the south pole of the moon. So the south pole of the moon doesn't see a whole lot of sunlight. Actually, there are parts of the south pole of the moon that never sees sunlight. So the idea is that if there is water on the moon, then it's very likely that in these places, there is still some preserved water ice that has essentially not evaporated due to the heat from sunlight. So it's the most likely place to go and find water. There are probably two important reasons why people are interested in going and finding water and other things in the South Pole. So the first reason is that, you know, the Earth and the Moon were formed roughly at the same time in the solar system's, uh, you know, whatever, uh, history, geological history. And the water that came on the Earth, it's not like the Earth had water when it was formed. That water came from somewhere else. So where did it come from? Uh, it's hard to study that on the Earth because the Earth is a very active uh, place. There have been volcanoes, earthquakes, a lot of human activity etc. So uh, people are trying to find this question out by looking at ice cores in the Antarctic and so on. But even that is, uh, you know, essentially disturbed kind of uh, uh, area. But in the moon, that water ice that's there on the moon has probably been there for the last four billion years or at least a few billion years. So if we actually can look at the minerals and the composition of that water, we can try and correlate that with what we find in, let's say, asteroids or comets and so on, and see if that has been the origin of water on the moon. So there's this origin of water story, which is very interesting, which is why uh, people are interested in studying the water on moon. The other reason is uh, even more kind of fantastical, which is that uh, if humans have to explore the solar system and beyond the solar system, we need to have certain stages with which we explore these areas. So the first stage that humans would possibly go to would be the moon. From the Earth, you go to the moon, use that as a base to then go further uh, in the solar system. So if you're going to go and create a human habitation on the moon, you need a place where there is water. And the interesting thing about the lunar South Pole is that there are these craters and also mountains. So, I mean, these are really some crazy ideas, but the craters will likely have the water, so you could melt that water and pump it up to the surface of the crater where you'd have all these buildings and so on where people would live. And then on the hills that are nearby, you would have solar panels that would get energy from the sun. So it's a, the South Pole is an interesting place where you, the higher reaches of the South Pole, higher altitudes of the South Pole, you have uh, sunlight and very, you know, below the craters you have uh, water. So that combination is what is uh, kind of ideal to support some kind of human habitation. Moon has been explored uh, 
yeah, exactly as you said, over the last 50 years. And uh, moon rocks and moon soil samples have been brought back to the Earth and they've been studied. In fact, a lot of those studies have confirmed that the moon definitely came from the Earth in the sense that it was um, the Earth broke apart due to likely the collision with something else and the, a chunk of the Earth essentially became the moon. So there are a lot of similarities between the composition of the soil and the rocks in the moon and the Earth. Um, other studies, I mean, they've tried to study, for example, is there a lunar atmosphere? There really isn't a lunar atmosphere, which actually brings me to a very, uh, another very interesting point, which is the technical difficulty in landing a rover or a lander on the moon compared to, let's say, on Mars. On Mars, uh, you know, the US, uh, NASA has landed several uh, rovers. And there, because, the Mar because there's a Martian atmosphere, you can actually deploy a parachute and slow down the descent of the uh, rover and lander. But on the moon, there is no atmosphere, so you cannot use this parachute uh, method of actually landing on the lunar surface. So you have to solely rely on these thrusters that will essentially counterbalance the effect of uh, moon's gravity and very gently land this uh, lander on the moon, much harder to do without the assistance of uh, the atmosphere, which would have allowed you to use uh, parachutes. Um, and the moon, uh, south pole of the moon lately over the last maybe a decade or so has been an interesting place because of what I just mentioned, the water and, you know, sunlight on the hills. Um, so very recently, actually, Russia launched a mission to the moon. Uh, that went from the Earth to the Moon very quickly. And then, unfortunately, the, this Russian lander crashed very, I mean, just about a week ago, crashed on the lunar surface. So everyone, because of that, because of this recent race to go back to the Moon, uh, everyone is really watching what ISRO does and what India is able to do in terms of landing this uh, lander and rover on the Moon. This is a, it's a very complex mission. So even sending something from the Earth to the Moon, even if it's something that orbits the Moon, requires a lot of precise kind of maneuvers to get you know, this man-made object to get to the Moon. So if you look at the path that this object, uh, this satellite took, it you know, essentially uh, orbited the Earth many times. That orbit was made more and more elliptical and then through a bunch of maneuvers that you know, became a large kind of circle and then it finally left the Earth's gravitational field and now it's slowly doing the opposite on the Moon. Essentially, you know, uh, the orbital radius is reducing and the lander is, uh, you know, the satellite and the rover are getting closer and closer to the, to the Moon. So technologically, I think just figuring out how to leave the Earth and then land on some other solar system body is itself a huge technical challenge and there's a lot of experience that uh, scientists in India will gain from being able to do that. Secondly, as I said, it will also help us, for example, do more complex missions. Uh, we already have sent uh, this uh, satellite and orbiter to Mars, Mangalyaan, which is orbiting Mars. So maybe someday we will land on Mars. The next thing is maybe you have a manned mission that goes to the moon. It would be nice to have, uh, you know, Indian astronauts walking around the lunar surface, planting the Indian flag, maybe like the way uh, the Americans did, uh, you know, whatever, 50 plus years ago. So uh, it'll be nice to send humans to the moon, maybe land on the moon, at some point land on Mars. So essentially the spin-offs um, in terms of space technology and space exploration are very direct and huge. How they affect the common person, you know, uh, all the people who are still living on the earth in India, that's much harder to kind of uh, imagine. But there are many things that come out of these kinds of space uh, kind of missions. Uh, we get better at making metals, better at getting, get making detectors. We get better with all the optical systems, the sensors, the electronics, uh, so many things, vacuum systems. And 
lot of those things then you know will help us develop certain other types of uh, industries that we rely on so one you know famous kind of uh, example is let's say our ccd chips most the ccd chips actually developed because of uh, very specialized application in astronomy and astronomical imaging this is you know 60 plus years ago and as astronomers and scientists became better at making these chips the chips became cheaper and cheaper to manufacture and today we have these ccd and cmos chips on devices that we carry in our pockets which are cell phones and those devices are extremely sophisticated and really good and part of the reason why they're so cheap and so freely available a lot of it has to do with what you know astronomers and other space scientists were trying to do uh, 60 years ago so that's a very tangible kind of spin off so there will be similar spin offs in terms of materials and technologies that humans will benefit from but you know maybe not tomorrow but let's say a decade or a few decades from now so the moon is an interesting object it's obviously earth's only natural satellite and it uh, it essentially revolves around the earth because it's so close to the earth it's uh, tidally locked to the earth so um the the moon spins about its axis but it spins at a rate that is equal to the rotation roughly rotation of the moon around the earth so we always see the same side of the moon wherever you are on earth the when you see the lunar surface you are essentially seeing the same part of the moon the back side of the moon which never presents itself to the earth that is the dark side of the moon now dark side of the moon it means it's just dark to us but that part of the moon does get sunlight and things like that so you know so dark side of the moon a bit of a misnomer you sometimes think that only one side of the moon is getting illuminated which is not true uh, which is also the reason why the south pole or even the north pole for that reason of the moon are interesting those are the only two regions which truly there are some places that don't get any sunlight because you have these craters and you, sun will not penetrate you know to those very low kind of dips on the lunar surface i mean if the lander lands it will be a remarkable achievement the rover will then be deployed so that so it doesn't end with just the landing the rover then comes out of the lander uh and if you go onto the isro website you can actually see how the lander you know a hatch opens out there's a ramp and this lander uh, you know the rover essentially will roll down this uh, ramp and start moving about the lunar surface so in fact right now as we speak what the lander is actually doing is constantly sending back pictures of the moon to really figure out in real time what is the best place to land that itself is kind of crazy because right now sitting on earth we do not know where there are rocks and where there are little potholes and other things so we have to find a relatively flat and nice place where this lander can land and that can only be done in real time so that's what's happening literally as we speak so if it lands that's a huge achievement that's you know more than 50% maybe of the success of the mission then this rover has to come down and things have to deploy and then the rover is going to move about the moon and it's not going to automatically move it'll be remotely controlled it'll go to specific parts and the rover also has a lifetime of a few days uh, maybe 10 or 12 days uh, until its batteries die out so after we land today we have maybe roughly i don't know two weeks or some or thereabouts to explore as much of that south pole as possible to get all the information getting the information means that there are sensors on the rover that will look at uh, the lunar soil it will look at water it will look at chemical composition uh, probably will take pictures to look at what the immediate neighborhood looks like so you know there are several you know mini missions that are part of this larger mission
So yeah, at Azim Premji University, any event like this, we try to get the students, uh, in fact, the students themselves uh, rally to, uh, for, to, you know, essentially have a viewing or to have some kind of talk or some kind of event surrounding something as momentous as this. So today in the evening from uh, 5.30 to 7.30, uh, the physics club has organized all students and all the whole campus community to get together in a large auditorium and uh, live view the landing of the Vikram lander. And if everything goes well, you know, people will be clapping and hooting. And it's, it's a nice experience, I think, for the campus community to be involved with something that is as important as this for not only India, but actually, you know, for humankind.